Hello and welcome to Trust Natira. Um, tonight we are privileged to welcome Dr. Coleman Dennehy. Uh, Coleman is um, one second. Uh, Coleman is a historian of Parliament, law and crime and punishment in early modern Ireland and also early modern England. An IRC Marie Slodowska Curie Fellow for almost four years. He has previously taught history at Limerick, UCD University College London, and at the Law School at the University of Vienna. He is a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society, Councillor of the Irish Legal History Society, and Second Secretary General, General of the International Commission for the History of Representative and Parliamentary Institutions. He has published many articles and chapters, as well as Restoration Ireland, Parliament in Ireland, 1613 to 89, Law and Revolution in 17th Century Ireland, and just last week, Sir Henry Bennett, Earl of Arlington and His World. He is now editing the sixth volume diary of Richard II, Earl of Cork, and the first Earl of Burlington, and is also working on crime and punishment in early modern Ireland, to be published by Bloomsbury. So, we're going to have a fantastic lecture ahead of us here now about the um, crime and punishment in the, in the 17th century Ireland. So uh, I'll pass it over to you, Colm. Right. Well, thanks very much, Colm and Liam, for having me on uh, to uh, to speak about crime and punishment. I'm very I'm very honoured and very um, very grateful for the opportunity to to talk at large about about one of my uh, kind of favourite topics. Um, I'll just pop up my, my PowerPoint so you can see it. If at any point during the lecture, by the way, my, you can't hear me quite as, as clearly as you might like, you can just uh, let me know. So here goes the PowerPoint. So um, that fellow there is uh, Bishop John Atherton on the left-hand side, Bishop of uh, Walford and Lismore. And on the right is a fellow named uh, John Shalters Proctor, his tithe collector. Both were, uh, well, uh, Atherton was executed in Dublin on Church Street in, uh, I think it was December 1640, and Child uh, uh, some time later in Bandon in County Cork. Uh, Atherton was executed, amongst the first in Ireland to be executed under a relatively recent act for the prevention of buggery, uh, which had passed through Parliament in 1630. Five, I think it was. And I'll start you off with a poem. Uh, that picture and some of the things I'll be talking about, obviously, will have some, uh, some of the topics will, will be um, a bit uh, uh, kind of edgy and extreme. So we'll be just talking a little bit about things like execution and, and rape and things like that. So that's a, a, sort of a, a sort of a content warning, if you like. Confusion, give my thoughts once leave to be exempted from thy lawless tyranny. If for the space of but one poor half hour, O oh, give me leave to sit in quiet bower, that I with patience may delineate in lines of life this prelate's sordid state, who first in England did his life receive, his education Oxford did him give. Thence to a benefice preferred he was, in which he vitiously his time did pass, and although married to a handsome wife, blessed with sweet children, the only joy of life. Yet so so fair baseness did in him prevail that unto lust he himself set to sail, deflowered virgins, marriage beds defiled, with many other virtuous crimes too vile. To be conceived beyond all measure proud, impudence and ambition did him shroud. Amongst his flock he sowed seditious strife, set friend against friend, husband against wife. So that amongst many he did live alone, and loving none beloved was of none. Lastly, through pride, high fair and lustful life, incest committed with sister of his wife, for which he sued his pardon and then fled to Ireland, where a worser life he led. And that's just a, an example of one of the the, the sort of the in, in a very large crowd in the 1640s, just before uh, the 1641 rebellion kicked off, and. Um, Although some of the accusations were to remain unproven, Atherton had a rap sheet that could legitimately include, it's a long list, so I'll read from the page, incest, infanticide, fornication, 
adultery, rape, sodomy, simony, accessory to murder, defilement of a body, by which I mean smoking an infant's body over a charcoal pan so it would not smell as it decomposed under the floorboards, illegal disposal of a body in addition to, by his own admission, reading of naughty books, viewing immodest pictures, frequenting of plays, and drunkenness. And the reason I've put Atherton up here, I won't be talking about him too much, um, is that there's two kind of salutary points that are worth remembering about him. First of all, our perceptions of crime change over time. So for Atherton, although he was hated at the time by Manny, he's nearly lynched on his way to court prison before his trial. He's since been resurrected uh, for some, at least some sympathy within the sort of LGBTQ world as an early victim of state's persecution of, of, um, of the gay community. And so can be seen as maybe a, a sort of a hero or a victim. And then also the need to be careful of posthumous uh, hero worship, but also character assassination. So enemies of the Church of Ireland, for example, in the 18th century, and indeed in the 17th, put out numerous uh, uh, quantities or large quantities of literature uh, against Atherton, highlighting his many sort of crimes. So what I'll be talking about today in the lecture is not just simply a legal history lecture. It's more, I think, a, an area where legal history and social history combine to, to give us ideas about how uh, communities in Ireland worked, not just the, the sort of nuts and bolts of the law and how it might have worked, but also things about moral transgressions and deviance, what might be sort of morally wrong as well as what might be legally wrong, or considered to be wrong at least in, in 17th century Ireland. So how I got into crime and punishment initially, um, after I finished my PhD, I was, I was sort of at a loss for exactly what to do. And the opportunity came to do an LLM, a legal master's in UCD at the Institute of Criminology. So I took a, a master's degree, a one year research or thought, thought master's at the Institute of Criminology at the Sutherland School of Law. And I spent a lot of time looking almost exclusively at contemporary criminology in the modern world. I looked specifically at, at um, sort of sex crime and sex work for my own thesis, but I did a lot of criminological theory, feminist theory, um, penology and stuff like that. And it occurred to me that other than just doing a degree for its own sake, which is obviously a wonderful way to spend a year, um, I thought that I could take some of the ideas that I had been working on and apply sort of modern criminological theory of, uh, of societies and applying them back to the 16th and 17th century and seeing to what extent there might be something useful to be learned by doing this. Now, it's nothing new and people have been doing this before, but I did find when I looked at criminal law and crime and punishment in Ireland that there wasn't quite as much written as I thought there might have been, you know, for what is usually a reasonably attractive subject to study, something that, you know, people watch so much crime kind of dramas on, on television and read crime novels and things like this. Uh, and and it's, it's an interesting sort of a topic and an easily accessible topic for undergraduates, yet we don't seem to have had a huge amount in the 17th century, at least during the early modern period. So I thought to myself, this is a, this is a territory that's, that's ripe for exploitation. So, so I set my mind towards doing that. And I've been giving a few papers around uh, the place and I got, uh, uh, I got a call from Anne-Marie Kilday at the Department of Criminal at, at Oxford Brookes University at Oxford and she asked me if I'd like to, to contribute to their series on I think it's called Crime, Punishment and Deviance. So the book that I'm writing now or trying to write is essentially a, a general history of crime and punishment in Tudor and Stuart Ireland uh, taking into account all of these things. So I've, I've got a, a sort of a script for part of this lecture but I'll, I'll, I'll be leaving it down for most of the time uh, so I hope that you'll be able to, to, to follow me okay. It's a, it's a, I think it's a very interesting topic. It's reasonably straightforward. I'll talk a little bit about the book I'm planning to write and where I think we need to cast our, our eye and cast our net in early modern Ireland in terms of what we can learn, not just what we can learn about crime or deviance or victims of crime or criminals themselves, but what it can tell us more generally as well about Irish society, uh, about uh, divisions in class or gender, or people speaking different languages or coming from different cultures. So it's not just learning about crime in the process of criminal justice, 
in Ireland. It will hopefully tell us a lot more about the early modern period more generally. It's just looking at this sometimes the same topic from a different direction or with a different sort of theory or a different idea can sometimes give us a, a, different, uh, a different perspective, you know. So Crime and Punishment in Early Modern Ireland, which is the book I'll be writing, will be a major study of this strangely neglected area of Irish history. Considering the phenomenon from the end of the medieval period that witnessed the, gross, the, the growth indeed of the English state and the end of the last vestiges of Gaelic independence, political independence, military independence at least. The study of crime is, I believe, an essential window through which to view the colonizing process in action. As Ireland was, according to some, at least the first English colony, although I think Wales may come in there as well, um, uh, and the common law took flight for the first time outside of England in Ireland, the Irish criminal justice system can easily be seen as a laboratory for state and societal control for crime and punishment. This research, this book, will consider its use and its misuse as a tool of imperial consolidation. With the destruction of the Gaelic lordships and most of the Norman liberties in the Tudor period, as well as the eclipsing of smaller jurisdictions such as the Liberty of St. Sepulchre's uh, in Dublin, Tudor and Stuart government in Ireland developed a series of replacements to exercise justice to keep the peace, uh, including the rollout of the Assize system, provincial presidencies, martial law, a star chamber jurisdiction, and local quarter sessions. As well as the political development of the system, my research will consider the nature and the development of criminal law as well as the development of the judiciary and all other apparatus of criminal justice in Ireland. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's going to be a history of, there's going to be plenty of law looking at statute law and developments in the common law, but also it's going to be a social history of Ireland about who's more likely to be involved in crime, what way does the state react, does it react differently, for instance, to men than it would to women, to Protestants, to Catholics, to people of English or British origin versus those of Irish origin, and if Irish are we talking about Anglo-Irish or Gaelic-Irish, these sorts of things. Um, as well as the political development of the system, this research will consider the nature and the development of criminal law, the development of the judiciary and the other apparatus, including the growth of jails, courthouses, places and methods of punishment. As well using justice to bend political and religious needs, which undoubtedly it does, uh, my book will account for more ordinary criminal justice in the localities and how this was administered in and by local communities. So taking a look at what the local community in any kind of bog standard town in, in Ireland will do, you know, because sometimes in Ireland we spend a lot of time looking through a lens of a sort of a national narrative of history, you know, be that an English Irish one or a Catholic, Catholic Protestant one, and instead maybe just look at communities as sort of isolated entities in themselves just about uh, punishing those who might be doing wrong rather than always seeing it through the ideas of a colonial imperial sort of um, uh, 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 engagement you know as well as using criminal justice um, oh sorry to local communities so whilst this will almost certainly not be able to claim to be the or even a comprehensive account of crime and justice in early modern Ireland it will be one of the very few to make crime and punishment and the criminal justice system in Ireland, its sole topic of interest, for the early modern period at least. The 18th century uh, has fared reasonably well, probably because source material is, for that is more plentiful. This is always the case when we move forward time-wise, you know, the, the nearer we get to today, the better the source material, or at least generally speaking. But also because perhaps crime and punishment was more of a political and immediate sensation at the time. In the 16th and the 17th century, we have no newspaper industry, which means no hysterical moral panics about garroting or a white slave trade, or the general fear around the time of the later 18th century when people were being sort of wound up by the press like we do today with the tabloids and indeed the broadsheets or the television news, constantly talking about the crime, constantly encouraging us to be fearful because it sells more advertising, it sells more newspapers. And so because we don't have that mass media, presence in early modern Ireland. And we start to see it in, emerging in, in England, maybe in the 16, in the mid 17th century in Ireland, we don't quite have it yet. So I would suggest that we don't quite have that fascination with crime that perhaps we do today. Um, 
These include some excellent studies such as Neil Garnham's study on early 18th century crime and punishment, which I think is a fantastic read, particularly dealing with the northeast of Ireland, where he's been very lucky to have some materials le uh, left. Recently, I wrote a review of a book by Timothy Watt on policing and protest in 18th century Ireland. That's, I, think, I thought it was an absolutely cracking read, a very interesting sort of idea, not just about the policing process of constables within the towns and the criminal justice system, but particularly looking at things like protest. How does the populace push back against a state that's growing more powerful over time and that is sort of gearing up for a, a more controlled sort of society? Do you know, because as sure as night follows day, as our society progresses through time, the state becomes more powerful and becomes more controlling and to look at how the people kind of push back at that at times and even people like I think Leanne Calvert doing work on Presbyterian courts not strictly speaking a criminal justice jurisdiction uh, but a fascinating look again on how communities are policing themselves in her case she looks at the Presbyterian communities in the Kirk sessions and a lot of the time just kind of policing things like immorality like sexual impropriety things like that that can sometimes come up in the criminal justice system in Ireland particularly in the towns where bylaws are presented to the population for a, a sort of a more rigorous control of people's behavior be that gaming drinking Sunday sports uh, gambling cockfighting all that sort of thing um, indeed Jimmy Kelly's work on the gallows speeches a book just solely made up a very good introduction but then just the speeches of condemned prisoners in the 18th century is a fascinating read on that process and that that sort of gearing up of a media system that looks to crime and to information or also perhaps fear to a point a recent article on child stripping which is probably about sort of stealing clothes rather than something uh, more terrible also one on rape in the same century our Tudor and Stuart period remains by comparison, I think somewhat neglected. In the 19th century as well, we have some excellent studies and probably more numerous than I can mention. Elaine Farrell writing specifically on infanticide, I think does an excellent job. Neve Howland on the jury system in 19th century Ireland, dealing sometimes with civil juries, but very much so with criminal ones as well. Bill Vaughan working on the murder trial in, in 19th century Ireland is a cracking read, one that everybody should be, should be getting a look on. Also Richie McMahon on homicide and pre-famine Ireland, I think is a, is a very good book. And more recently, more specific uh, studies such as uh, um, Kelleher on, from UCD, the School of English on Mam Strassner murders, these famous murders of these Irish speaking characters from Joy's country in North Galway, very much looking at the idea of language uh, and how it can be problematic within the criminal justice system, but also not just about language, but also culture and, you know, perhaps 19th century ideas about race and ethnicity and where people fit in. In the 17th century in Ireland, we've had some more work done, perhaps uh, on more narrow topics, such as John Crawford's excellent book. It's on my shelves there. I, I won't pull it down for you, but it's well worth a look on the Court of Castle Chamber. Again, this is a multi-jurisdictional kind of court in that it looks at civil law, uh, and also sort of prerogative justice, dealing sometimes with, with crime issues such as things like riot. Now, interestingly enough, something like the Court of Castle Chamber never is allowed to, um, it, it's always seen in a negative light, I think. It's something that we, we, have, we have ran with from the 17th century, but it's, it's always a curious court for me because it can't inflict a death penalty, although it can inflict corporal punishment such as ear cropping, nailing through the tongue, slitting your nose, or something like that. Uh, and, and it has unlimited fines as far as I can see as well. But nevertheless, it's seen in a very negative light, but, but perhaps it's something which uh, it may seem like a strange thing to say, but compared to a capital punishment system, which the common law is, it, it might, might bring a little bit more of a civilized system, perhaps in a way, uh, to, to, to Ireland and to Dublin. It's an excellent PhD thesis on vagrancy, which is one of the most fascinating issues in early modern Ireland. as laws passed in Elizabeth's reign in Ireland, dealing with poverty, essentially criminalizing poverty and again if you want to understand the society that we live in today I think studying the history of poverty in the past not just workhouses in the 19th century going all the way back to medieval poverty and early modern poverty and seeing how we criminalize it and it's an impossible uh, role to take it's not something that something consciously would walk into but if you find yourself in the circumstance you are in effect criminalized by that 
and that 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 piece is excellent you know it's a criminal justice issue raymond gillespie did i thought an excellent small chapter on women and crime in the 17th century in a book on on early modern irish women but it's, it's only a short wee piece it's a teaser more than anything i uh, hope you wouldn't mind me saying but it's a very very useful kind of preliminary look at how we could approach issues like gender and crime which again are fascinating and, and something i'll have something to say about uh, later on in the lecture um a, a recent article well, recent 2015 i think it was robinson writing on rape in the 1640s in ireland published in irish historical studies i thought was a very a very interesting and a very a useful article on 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 this topic uh, also people like dave edwards aaron mcardle stephen uh, carroll writing on martial law which is essentially military law and approach to crime one which is becoming a really hot topic i think for early 17th century ireland and again and elizabethan ireland and again you can see the contemporary um uh, sort of of, of uh, commonalities with the times that we live in today not just looking in america but other parts of the globe as well where we sort of militarize police and we we sort of take a, a sort of a a much harder sort of less humane reaction towards crime and politicizing these issues using soldiers and like i say militarizing our police where the police now are walking around looking like they're in the sas rather than the 1950s policeman that we might always like to think about with with a, a, a very useful sort of sense of of common sense and, and a common sense approach to crime um the two chapters by mccardle and carroll in fact in in that book that uh, that that uh, column just mentioned law and revolution in 17th century ireland that published uh, back in march more recently as well people like dave edwards uh Bork lennon and Claude tate published a book which i think is a really important book on on violence in early modern ireland it's called age of atrocity now it, it deals mostly with uh kind of state violence outside of the traditional criminal justice system so again look at martial law and violence in 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 sort of uh in military conflicts but there's some very interesting information in that and i think it's very well worth a, a look if you haven't seen it before but mine is to be a broad study taking into account the legal and political developments of criminal law and criminal law administration it's not simply writing a quantitative study uh, of relative numbers of executed versus those reprieved i couldn't possibly do that because most of our legal records for assizes and for the king's bench and for the quarter session so all all varieties of, of jurisdictions went up in smoke in the four courts in 1922 as i'm sure most of you have heard of this really most terrible thing to happen for historians i, I think bar nothing else was the destruction of the four courts because our ability to, to study that past has has really hit a, an extra hard now um it's always possible that a lot of these sources may not have made it to a perfect state of of collection otherwise but certainly lots of stuff got destroyed and, and we need to be very sad about that so i can't do uh you know 57 percent of the people who were who were prosecuted were for property crime versus 23 percent for crimes against the person that's an impossible study for ireland i don't think we'll ever be able to do that sort of one uh, i will do a little bit of that where i can nor can i do a qualitative study where we can look at the procedures or the nature of how criminal justice is is um is established and provided for in specific cases so for instance we do have a handful of cases a lot of them against churchmen interestingly enough like atherton like bishop devani a catholic bishop in 19, 1612 like the reverend lackey a, a republican the theocratic revolutionary in the early 1660s who wanted to bring down the royalist government uh, Oliver Plunkett indeed I've got a plaque from there behind my chair I won a, a prize in primary school for not missing a day and they gave me a plaque with a picture of Oliver Plunkett on it so we can do those sorts of trials and I've written quite a bit about these sort of figures and how they feature both through their trial process and also through their executions but again they're just a handful of them and the big problem with studying these sort of figures they're attractive personalities to study and they tell us quite a bit about the times that they were living in but they're the history of the great men of the important figures who make it into the history books and their cases are what we call state trials they're important treason cases they're not your run-of-the-mill kind of odc or ordinary decent criminal just doing your average sort of murder or theft they're, they're guys who are who are accused of and in some cases even not guilty of 
uh, treasons and plots and things like that. So it's not very typical and it's not a very easy one to follow in that regard. Uh, I'll also try to provide some light on those aspects of crime and how they are studied, but these approaches won't dominate the book that I'm planning to write. They're too few in number and there's not enough detail about how, how procedure works. Instead, seen through the lens of the colonial development of the Kingdom of Ireland, my research and the publications I hope to write from them um, views crime and punishment in conjunction with policies of Anglicization, Protestant and Protestantization, sorry, I can't say the word, changing societies and security concerns. Any book on Ireland in this period will struggle to be taken seriously, but if it doesn't engage with these areas, as these really are the political issues of the two centuries and they change everything in Ireland. Ireland's very different in 1500 to what it becomes by sort of 1700, uh, which is roughly the period that I'm working on. It combines all facets of crime and punishment that are available to be studied and it will allow for as complete and as thorough a study of crime as is possible. It attempts to say something of the criminals and the victims where possible, their gender, which is usually fairly obvious, with the exception of some men uh, who I've found with the name Hyacinth, which is a, a fellow's name in, in, in 17th century Ireland, but I think is, is generally taken to be a, a female name uh, these days. Um, but aside from gender, clues to things like class, class, the one thing that Irish historians tend not to talk about all that much, becoming more popular recently, mostly in the 20th century, but to have a good st study of class in society and the various, because we always sort of look to the, the religious question and the national question. Instead, look how classes in society work. Not all that kind of, it's not, it's not impossible and it has been done a little bit for sure, but I think there's, there's, there's lots of, of, um, of hay to be made in, in those sorts of areas. And, and crime is one of the perfect ways to study something like class because it's such a class-based uh, system as it's generally uh, uh, put forward. Also things like religion, ethnic makeup where it's possible. And again, ethnicity is very hard to, to study just by surname because it's not always obvious, even with you know the O's and the Max versus the new English names versus the, the, the later sort of British or, 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 or new English names. Um, for ease of understanding, the, the research plan, on which I'm going to sort of give you really quickly, uh, is broken down into its identifiable sections, which will likely resemble a sort of a, a chapter layout that I might write for this monograph, which I, which I hope to write at some point over the next sort of year, year and a half. First of all, I need to talk about kind of what was called theory and historiography, which is essentially asking ourselves, why has this book not been written already? Why? in how many, what, 100, 150 years where we've been writing professional or near professional history, why hasn't somebody written a book on crime and punishment in the 16th and the 17th century? Um, I'm not saying that it's never been tackled in some shape or form, but I don't believe that we've had a book which makes this its core area. Um, it's not just looking at the period in Ireland, it also considers the nature of how we write a history of crime in places like England, Scotland, uh, uh, and also on the western side of the Atlantic and also within Europe itself, ascertaining to what extent those historiographical developments might be applicable to early modern Irish crime and the criminal justice system. I think probably a lot of European studies where they've got a, a probably a stronger sense of, of uh, looking at crime through a social history sort of lens or perspective has given them a, a, a quite an interesting sort of a history that we haven't I think yes, managed, and maybe we won't manage it, it's not always possible, but I think it's something to look at. It needs, uh, it needs to meet a need, not just for an Irish historiography, but also a criminal justice historiography. So not just looking through national focuses, the way other countries have done it, but also looking at how criminologists might have studied the past, rather than how historians who work in the past might study crime and criminology, you know? So taking the criminological theory of how, how sort of offending might work, how prisons are deemed to work, um, how people stop committing crime, perhaps, um, things like that. It will establish to what extent it can or cannot be a comprehensive history of crime in the period and how issues such as source material, archives, and general early modern historiography might include or might influence our outlook on early modern Irish crime. Essentially, it sets out the stall of this book, placing it firmly within the context of early modern Irish history, but also colonial historiography, because whether we like it or not, Ireland's a kingdom, yes, 
and it's a standout kingdom from the 1540s onwards. But it's also, I think, you can see and the way that its society is, is attempted to be set up, at least, it's clearly part of a colonial project as well. So it's useful to look sometimes at, at the colonial historiography and also, like I say, criminal justice history. Now, in many respects, the comparative side can be problematic, for although Irish legal culture obviously bends a knee to the English example, our society, which is the other half of the study, is radically different. Ireland is not all that much like England, even though the legal system ostensibly is, is based on that. You know, uh, in terms of, of, of its language, obviously we have Irish and English spoken in Ireland. In England, it's mostly, well, with the exception of, of Cornwall, English in Wales, obviously, well, they have mixed languages there. Um, but in Ireland, it's, it's the, the differences are, are, are all the more stark, the chasm. Culturally, it's a substantially different country. Ethnically, it's a substantially different country different social mix, different relationships with the state. You know, Ireland, England in many respects, outside of those sort of kind of sort of regional out of the way places, if it's not too offensive a term to use, um, uh, England is a fairly homogenous sort of a society compared to Ireland, which is really quite heavily split, not just Gaelic and English, but also remember the Scots coming in through the Northeast, who have their own sort of cultural and ethnic divides as well, and linguistic sometimes. So naturally, this may not lead to a, a may, may lead to a different sort of a criminal justice system, uh, and how a different manner, ma uh, a different way that it dispatches its responsibility. It might be worth our while thinking about, for example, is there comparison to be made, like I say, in the colonial sense, with something like early colonial America? If you look at the way criminal justice works there, you know, uh, kind of most obviously, people think of something like the Salem witch trials, but the Puritans who go over to America in these early phases, in the, in the sort of 1620s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, they go to set up a, a sort of an idealized sort of a, a, a new England as such. Um, and how does Ireland compare to that? Sometimes the comparison is well worth a look. In other ways, that's not at all. Is there a case for comparing something like the bloody road? So stay, you know, uh, not just looking at a different country, but looking at a different time, the 18th century, particularly in England, we find that criminal justice legislation mushrooms in a huge way. The number of offences mushrooms and the number of offences which carry the death penalty go from somewhere in the region of just under 50 to, I think, somewhere in the region of just over 200. So the, 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 the crimes for which you can be hung uh, are quadrupled and there's a, a sense that criminal justice gets very tough in the 18th century. Now, we know from books like uh, say there's a recent book by a guy called Michael Wallace uh, that looks at, I think it's the northwest of England or maybe North Wales. And we see from there, for instance, that England's bloody code as it's practiced in London is probably quite different from how it's practiced in the Northeast. So regional variations might be worth looking at in terms of looking at Ireland, not maybe as a separate entity, but just for the purposes of the study, looking at as the core being sort of London, as the further you move away from London into these re regional areas, uh, criminal justice may be practiced in a very different sort of a fashion. Is there any comparative comparisons to be made with people like uh, how she's called Bloody Mary, Mary I of England and Elizabeth I, and sort of uh, sectarian divisions within England, where we see lots of, for example, in Bloody Mary's time, uh, lots of Protestants get burnt, I think somewhere in the region of about 300 are executed. In Elizabeth's reign, much longer reign than Mary's, about the same sort of figure. Now, we know that the, the positive uh, statutes against Catholicism in Elizabeth's reign, and indeed in the 17th century, are actually very few. There's very few laws against Catholics actually just being Catholic compared to England. Uh, there's almost none in this period. The penal laws, we have to wait until the 1690s. So how does that comparison work? We know that there's religious warfare in Ireland, but it's done, I would suggest, more through the armies than probably through the criminal justice system. But it's worth you know, for instance, that there's a number of, of religious figures who are dispatched. So Bishop Hurley of Cashel in, I think it's the 1580s, is executed in Dublin. Uh, I, I believe it to be under a martial law commission. But as part of that criminal justice system, how does that work? And is there a useful comparison to look at England at the time? What can we say about Scotland as well? Can we bring Scotland into this discussion? Scots are various times, sometimes it's just a trickle, but sometimes there's a, a, a surge of, of, 
of immigration or colonization, use which term you prefer. It's different things at different times. And we see, say, for instance, like a book like uh, Andrew Snedden's excellent book on the Island McGee Witch Trials. Now, this is early 18th century, a little bit out of my time, but it's interesting to look at. And I, I think, I don't know if Andrew would agree with me, but I'd, I'd put forward the idea that maybe what we're looking at here is, is, is really a, a sort of a Scottish cultural event and part of the Scottish population and that that witchcraft trial is part of, of the Scottish witch craze. Because what we'll see in Ireland is that witchcraft doesn't actually uh, feature that heavily in Irish society, which is strange. And I've yet to see a convincing explanation for why that is the case. There's some good theories, do you know? Um, but we see it in Scotland, we see it in England. These are the cultures and the legal justice systems and the criminal justice events that should be influencing Ireland under that colonial model. But for some reason, we don't really see in any meaningful sense a witch craze like we do in England or Scotland or indeed in Germany or France or Spain or places like that. Like I could count on hands, uh, obvious one in Kilkenny, that's that's a medieval one, Keitler, Island McGee in I think 1711, there's about six or eight people there. Uh, Florence Newton in, is it Kinsale or Yall in 1661? Uh, and apart from that, there's one, there's one in the 1580s in Kilkenny, there's two witches executed. And interestingly enough, what's what's described in the source as a blackamoor, which is, is very interesting in terms of concerns that people have had over recent weeks with things like black lives, that we have somebody of African origins in Ireland at the time. Because uh, I, I, you know, perhaps I wouldn't have expected, although perhaps I should have done, there's plenty of people. It's an interesting sort of a take in terms of looking at things like ethnicity and race in Ireland, perhaps something that we don't always think of, that we might be more aware of. But those things are important. Or do we go back to a traditional sort of, maybe not a historical way of looking at it, but sometimes a general cultural sense of Ireland today, which is that Ireland is exceptional, that it's special, that it's not like anything that any other country, and that it should be just studied in its own sort of, uh, within its own sort of laboratory because it, it, it's not like any other places and it's a bit different from everything else. And there's some, there's, some, there's some reason why that might well be the case. And then, but I think to abandon all sort of comparative sense is probably a mistake, but I think there's a lot to be learned uh, from looking at other areas. I also want to spend some time looking at crime in pre-plantation Ireland, that is in the early part of the period, looking at uh, areas where Irish, um, criminal justice is, is still probably in that sort of late medieval sort of phase and see where, where that might take us. Looking at sort of Gaelic Irish responses towards crime, for example, uh, we know that they, the traditional Irish legal system doesn't have a strong sort of sense of what criminal justice might be. They are offences to kill somebody or to take, to take property that isn't your own, but it doesn't have the same sort of sense of the common law of Capital and capital, capital punishment. The the ERAC, the um, my pronunciations are probably quite terrible. The these blood payments, for example, which are sort of compensation payments to the family of somebody that you have harmed, is something that that we don't see so much of in the criminal in the the English common law system. Kian August uh, eighth gain the recovery and compensation system also for theft and the King Co focus, which is a fascinating area, that of kin or family responsibility for when people do harm that uh, their general community group might be out for that to, to some point. And this is used in the late Elizabethan period. We know that Spencer is very uncomfortable with the idea of something that is so clearly foreign to the Irish uh, or to the English common law system, this kin responsibility system, very uncomfortable. And I've come across a volume full of kin co-focus or, 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 um, or, or uh, uh, warrants from the 1660s and the 1670s in the Cart Collection, the Ormond Papers at the Bodleian uh, University uh, Library at the University of Oxford. This is fascinating. In the 1670s, they're still willing to use some element of old kind of Brehan law or Gaelic Irish law to deal with with crime and population control issues in North Tipperary in the 1670s. Now, that is absolutely not a common law system or common law provision that they're using. They're using a Gaelic Irish system, perhaps because it works in the Gaelic Irish population and because it gets results. But nonetheless, the idea that, the, the, that we should always be following that, that pure common law system, that is not what is applied in its pure sense in Ireland. You know, we get a sort of a, maybe a little bit of a hybrid system. This martial law system, again, that they use in the Middle Ages uh, is worth a look as well. This kind of hybrid system, 
where we take perhaps the best elements of the common law system and the best elements of the, the Gaelic law system and what works on the frontiers between the, the sort of Anglo-Norman community or the old English community as it becomes and the more Gaelic or Gaelicized elements of society. These areas far away from Dublin, but not quite in pure Gaelic areas and the law system that they're using to essentially, how do you keep the peace? How do you compensate people or punish people for their transgressions or their wrongdoings? There's very interesting things to be looked at, I think, in there as well. Does Gaelic law, is it a more civilised system or a more humane system than the English common law, where the preference for the rope is used so often with all felonies having the death penalty? I'm not suggesting that they always end in a death penalty, but there's provision, at least, for execution in so many justice uh, uh, events that come before the courts, whereas we don't see that in the Gaelic Irish system. So people like, say, only Folio, who I think might be listening to this, has done obviously quite a bit on this already, looking at things like a very good chapter on on sort of executions in, in 14th and 15th century Ireland and how that system works. And I know she's working on other areas as well. Also, I think looking at the theory of colonising Ireland as well and what part uh, the criminal justice system plays in that. So we know, for instance, looking at work by people like David Heffernan and, and, and Mark Hutchinson, that um, there's a number of thinkers in England and some Ireland as well, who lay down this sort of programme for government, a programme for colonisation, literally a plan to follow with steps to be taken on how you reduce Ireland, how you, you know, do my, my kind of air quotes, how you civilise Ireland, how you make Ireland peaceable and how you make it profitable and how you create a little England. This, this kind of standard colonization board, you see it in 19th century uh, Africa as well, when the European powers get down there, is, is how do we make Ireland pay, and also how do we make it not be a problem? And the, the system that we go about is little England and Ireland, and what part of a role does criminal justice play? The more I look at it, the more I'm thinking there's probably not a huge amount in it. Criminal justice may well be a second thought after things like profit, and land law and things like that for a lot of the thinkers who set up these, these schemes and these ideas for Ireland. But again, just looking at things like civilizing and pacifying Ireland can be, can be processes that need to be looked at. Ostensibly, they tend to go for martial law a lot more than, than criminal justice in the traditional sense, in the common law sense, but it's worth taking a look at. And then what I really want to do, which I, which I quite enjoy and I've, I've done quite a bit of work on already is uh, is to look at a corpus of criminal law for Ireland. So I've just realised I've been talking far too much and not moving on these slides. Um, this will give you an idea. We don't pass many statutes in Ireland in the early modern period, as you can see. Henry VII's reign is 25, 66 in Henry VIII's long reign, none in Edward's reign, Philip and Mary, 14 statutes in just one parliament, Elizabeth 44 across, I think it's three separate parliaments. 10 in James II's 22-year reign, Charles I, very productive. And then you'll see how important criminal law is in the second column, where in many cases it's not all that important. Compared to what our society today does, I don't have figures on me, but if you look at the amount of new crimes being created every year in countries like Ireland or in the UK, where we're constantly criminalising lots of human behaviour. Now, sometimes it's just fiddling with, with offences that have already existed but there's, there's hundreds of, of new laws created. I, I, I can't remember the exact figure for Tony Blair's government, but it's, it's a huge amount. And what you're doing is, is not necessarily improving society, but you are criminalizing society in that wrong. So just looking at, at what we can do there, um, the first uh, parliament there in 1495, there's two very important laws passed. Uh, the first legislation that all public law in England was from that point applicable in Ireland. Uh, whilst the second upgraded the punishment for all murders in Ireland to that of haute treason, which is a high treason, citing that the Irish never take a mere hanging seriously and hence the need to sort of get tough on crime, thus introducing a considerably different element to the law of murder. Now this begs the question then as to what exactly was the criminal law in Ireland and to what extent might it have differed from that of England. The common law of Ireland was in all likelihood very similar to the common law of England, never exactly the same. Uh, but but probably quite similar. But as you can as you can see from the from the graphic up there, the past two centuries covered by my research, where England's pace of statutory development is um, is far out on uh, Ireland's. My own preliminary investigation suggests that although many English statutes were replicated 
word for word about the Irish Parliament, particularly in Charles I's Parliament, which is why they can pass so many acts so quickly. It's just a rubber stamping English laws that have already existed. Um, there were times when the criminal law was found wanting in Ireland. For instance, offences, uh, the, one of the judges in Munster, I think in, the, in, in, um, in late in Elizabeth's reign, suggests using laws against the um, against Irish clergy that simply didn't exist in Ireland. First of all, it, it highlights that some of the judges weren't well, very well clued in on what the Irish law was, but also that it was seen to be deficient in so many senses. It also takes into account earlier collections of statutes, but more importantly, and this book that's coming up now, Justice of the Peace, uh, consisting of two books by Sir Richard Bolton, later the Lord Chancellor, is, is fiercely important. It's a guidebook essentially for new justices of the peace. So we have, I don't know how many justices of the peace in Ireland. Uh, I think, Colin, I think it was probably your brother Liam suggested that maybe something like about 300 in, in late 17th century Ireland. These are your sort of um, kind of playing the role of policemen in the countryside. The towns have their own constables. Uh, justices of the peace, they, they, they can sometimes serve a civil function of uh, similar to a sheriff for each county that they're, they're, they're essentially enforcing uh, writs from, from Dublin on not just criminal justice issues, but all sorts of civil administration as well. But this is essentially a guidebook for the new justices of the peace, um, essentially telling them how to do their work. And you'll see on the table on the right hand side, just a long list of all the various kind of felonies of what's an affray, what's a murder, how to arrest somebody, what's a posse comitatus, uh, you know, how to do bail, how to do murder, manslaughter, what's the differences between the two, homicides, casual deaths, all these sorts of things. And it's a fascinating idea of exactly what is contained in the law in Ireland, because it's not always possible because we don't have a law reporting system in Ireland up until really in, in, in reality, the 18th century, I think. So the idea, and there's not, never much on law anyway. So the idea of a book like this is really useful and he's a superb lawyer himself. So I'd be quite trusting of his, of his interpretation of what the common law is, but it's a very good idea. And you can add to that other people like Blackstone's commentaries, I think it's volume four that deals with crime. That's a very good idea of what the common law in England is. And Ireland's is, like I say, probably quite similar. And also I think you'd have to read Sir Matthew Hale's History of the Police of the Crown, more famous for its, its famous sort of idea, uh, or infamous perhaps, on identifying what marital rape is in the early modern period. But it's, it's overall, it's a brilliant book on just identifying exactly what the law is and the theory of criminal justice law in the period. Um, so the, the law as we study it, I think will be quite different for Ireland and books like this and statutes that we can find in the collections uh, become a very important part of that. But a book like that, and that's, that's freely available online, you can find it on our archive.org. It's a very interesting read in terms of just how that criminal justice system, I would say should work, I'm not sure that it always does, but how these people go about their, their ideas. Um, having, um, uh, Having concerned ourselves with the theory and the statute and common law, I would then move on to consider the practical aspects of criminal law, where I think probably the more interesting and exciting, well, I don't know if exciting is the word, but perhaps more interesting aspects of, of the work that I'd be looking at. This is the rollout of the Azai system. Ireland's just uh, fully um, broken down into counties in the early 17th century. And with the coming of counties come sheriffs and Azai systems, which is essentially just like your uh, circuit court judges today. Judges move around a number of counties, usually in groups of two, dispensing justice twice a year, usually around October and usually around April. It's just with the, the weather and the, when the, the sowing season is done and lambing and everything else, and they dispense justice in this sense. The role of interpreters, how in a multilingual system, it's grand for people who can speak both languages, but how do you dispense justice, particularly in Gaelicized areas like parts of Ulster and on your Connacht, you know, West Connacht, parts of, of, of Munster as well, where English isn't really spoken and judges coming straight off the boat can't speak any Irish. We do know there's some judges who do, and we know, for instance, somebody like Justice Sarsfield from Cork in the 1620s, notoriously hears a full, a full murder case in Irish, Oskelga. So the idea that judges not, not willing to, to speak Irish isn't that clear. And lots of judges who come from Ireland, whose families come from Irish, and but, but there's surely a sense that there must be also an interpretive system of some sort for the judges that don't. And it's probably just a case that, that 
somebody local who has both languages will interpret the cases as they go. But, but we can't be sure about that. But it's certainly something that we have to take into account. It will be very different from the English system as it goes, you know. Uh, looking at the ideas of new judges, like I say, getting new judges in to who know the law. Now, the, the law is sophisticated law for Ireland. It's, it's quite basic, but it's still something that they may need to, to, to use and to look at. Looking at things like new buildings, where you hold these sorts of trials. New, you know, you're building a whole new infrastructure where there was none before. So it's grand for old English counties, you know, like sort of South Wexford or Waterford, Kilkenny, Tipperary, Dublin, Kildare, places like that. But for areas that have been just recently come in under that, that the, the writ of the king uh, of the Stuart dynasty in the early 17th century, these are all new, new areas and we have to build everything from scratch. It's literally starting, starting from nothing. Um, the arguments over where the assizes will be held, the profits for the local people, because there's a whole industry that comes with this, so there's money to be made. And new prisons to be built. After 1635, we get House of Corrections are created where uh, for the first, maybe not for the first time, but where the incarceration is the actual punishment, not just a holding pen until you can uh, try people and dispatch them at the gallows or the pillory or take a fine, but where actually locking somebody up for three months or for a year is the punishment for their wrongdoing. Places of public punishment, if you look at town records, they're a fascinating window onto the local administration of criminal justice, where you look at somewhere like Irishtown in Kilkenny, where every sort of 10 or 15 or 20 years, they have to build a new pillory or new gallows. Same in Belfast, same in Yall, places like that, where these sort of the manifestations of the, the physical manifestations of things like gallows and pillories. And also a rack, which we have in Dublin as well for torture, which we don't talk about all that much for Ireland, is the use of torture in that system. Ostensibly, it's not to be used in a common law system. And a lot of English legal historians are very proud of the fact that there's no there's no torture used in their system, but it is used in the prerogative system. And it's used in England at, this, at the same time as well. The idea is used. Now, we, in the modern criminologists would say the punishments being used are a form of torture in the early modern period, you know, corporal punishments or, or death, but the actual torture pre-trial just to take information from people is something that does happen sometimes in Ireland. How much am I? It's quite interesting to look at. Also, I think I'll need to be looking at things like, um, what we might call politicizing crime or political crime or political punishments. So for instance, looking at figures like Tories and Rapparees, these guys who become landless in the course of the 17th century, perhaps before then, or maybe the, the military men of the Elizabethan period, the masterless men who are deemed to be troubled by authorities, by central authorities, and who sometimes very much are. And how do we deal with people like them? Like those Tories and Rapparees, you know, for instance, the Bishop of Ossery, at one point as a JP before he comes bishop, takes off the head of a Tory in his kitchen. He's a churchman who's got a, a, a criminal justice res, uh, um, responsibility. And because this, this, this guy's a Tory, he's sort of an outlaw. So he's, he can be effectively dispatched without, without a trial. And this guy who later becomes a bishop, and people are nervous about making him a bishop on this basis, literally takes out a sword and lops this guy's head off. These are very important figures. How do treason trial works? using the criminal justice to dispatch your political enemies. Uh, anybody like, like Atherton, uh, the picture of who we had up earlier, Oliver Plunkett or, or people like that, you know. Uh, the politicization of crime in the beginning of war in 1641. 1641, just a military event that goes out of control when the people can't be controlled. Or should we look at it through a criminal justice perspective where there's lots of theft and murder and some rape and other things like that. Uh, again, it's it's very hard to look at purely as a criminal justice event because it's so widespread and it's at a time of of of, of war, of, of an indisputable time of war at the time. But also looking at judicial or indeed extrajudicial execution of priests and bishops at this time. Even things like church courts, which I think are fascinating, not strictly speaking part of that criminal justice system, but they can use shame punishments, which we use all the time in Ireland, and we still do today, in fact. Um, that making somebody stand in a white sheet with a penance, kind of a placard, uh, and the embarrassment of being in their community is something that's that's very important. But we can see sort of some sort of figures. It's worth looking at. Uh, in the National Library, we have two books, two volumes of Tipperary Eyes records from Clonmel. Um, I think they're the grand jury records from what I can see. But you can see that there is a possibility there on occasion of breaking down 
ideas around crime and gender. I've got, you know, from names, we can sometimes play the game of trying to identify what sort of ethnic or religious identity people might have. It's a very, very dangerous game to play. Those, those names aren't always obvious as to who is what. But we can look at the offences. The, the, the second column that you'll see are the offenders or the accused, uh, the gender, the, the kind of offence or the issue that comes before the court. And then the, the victim, I think, is the next column. And then the punishment. And then some notes down the end. But what you'll see there that I perhaps I found surprising, but when I look at it now, I shouldn't be all that surprised, is that very few people are being found guilty. Now, these are grand juries, so it's it's a pre-trial hearing, but we get to, to hear the eventual uh, the eventual um, outcome of the trial. There's only one in that list guilty, a woman, Catherine Brown, for the theft of animals, stealing them from Thomas Smith. Guilty three months in the House of Correction. She could have been executed, but I find that execution is, is for a lot of people, a last resort. And perhaps that criminal justice system is far more civilised than we thought that it might have been before that point. Do you know? I don't see many uh, executions happening, and there's there's some corporal punishments, but it's not it's not probably as prevalent as perhaps it should be. We can see them as well here. These are what's coming up as Kilkenny quarter sessions, so they're they're lesser offences being heard locally in the, in the city of Kilkenny itself, and we'll see probably more punishments in these sort of courts where there's not a death sentence available. They're mostly misdemeanors, not felonies, so there's no death sentence available. So things find some punishment. And it makes you wonder if it's easier to find somebody guilty in that system because I think as a jury or a local community, people are nervous about killing in a judicial sense. They don't want to execute the criminals, as far as I can see. So slap on the wrist or kick up the arse or whatever it might be that is seen as, as a suitable sentence is more preferable is preferable to stringing somebody up by a rope. And remember for a murder in Ireland it's treated as a treason. So that means the punishment is hanging, drawing and quartering. And that's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a horrific punishment. And if, if, the, if the intention in 1495 by the government was to, uh, to, to make the punishment such that, uh, that people are terrified of, of committing the crime, it possibly doesn't work because we'll see that, that the punishment is not often laid on. It's not as prevalent as you might think. So I don't know if you can read those quite clearly, but they're, they're all sorts of small things, a little bit of assault and battery, a little bit of, of theft, um, a little bit, uh, somebody's plucking cherries from the Duke of Ormond's uh, orchard, um, all sorts of things, entertaining, entertaining foreigners in your house, um, you know, uh, encouraging apprentices to spend their master's money in houses of ill repute, keeping a new, an evil rule in the house, which could mean it's been used as a brothel. It could be also just a gambling den or maybe drinking when you shouldn't be, things like that. Theft of shoes, stockings, pots, things like that. But there's probably more guilty verdicts been handed down here than at the more serious assizes where the punishment is more severe. But again, the actual punishments are, are nothing spectacular, ordered into the House of Correction on occasion and some fines. A couple of people are whipped out of town and, and that's about it. You know, Now, whipping can be very traumatic, both in the psychological sense and in the physical sense. But, you know, compared to ending up on a rope, I'd suggest it's not nearly as bad as it could be. Um, so what can this tells us huge amounts, obviously, these sorts of sources about how the urban community is, is living together. Because I think probably we see greater use of a criminal justice system in an urban environment where people are living cheek by jowl in small, in, in sort of within small spaces, but sometimes in bigger populations. So the, the, the occurrences of violence in the community or theft or, or things like that, people who are living in more isolated areas. So the, the town records tend to give you a, perhaps a, a sort of a kind of a juicier collection of, of material to work with. Uh, but it's very interesting to see what is going on in the towns, what are offences, uh, what's perhaps not there that you might find interesting. I'm still working through all these figures. We don't have them from any places, Longford, Tipperary, Kilkenny. And then I've got a few smaller records for St. Sepulchre's in Dublin and some of the town records for places like uh, Belfast, Dublin, Yall and a few other places, Clonmel, the Breeden Grass done, uh, show up some interesting sort of features, but, but they don't always tell us as much as we might like. Um, and like I was saying about that effort not 
to kill people. People, I think, are probably quite nervous in the early modern period. It's a violent period, and Ireland's a violent place, and when wars break out, the slaughter is unimaginable. Huge numbers are getting killed in the Munster uh, campaigns in the 1570s and 1580s. Really horrific. Uh, you know, if you read some of the details, it would really turn your stomach. Same in the 1640s as well. It's a regular criminal justice system for some reason. People are I think a bit anxious about actually passing a sentence of death. Um, the need for ex the problem with execution and the need for clemency we see in this. I don't know if you can read that script there at home. I'll read it for you if you can't. It says Mary Babington, Lady Dowager to Christopher, late Lord Baron of Dunsany was murdered at Clonny, which is just outside Blanchardstown on the, in West Dublin, by Honora Nicafferty, nurse to one of her children on the 19th of March, 1609. She left issue, which is her son, Patrick, now Lord Baron of Dunsany, aged about 15 years, and a daughter. And this is the most interesting part of this entry. A knave, not long after executed for another crime, cleared this wretched woman who had suffered being burnt alive and took the murder upon himself. So when he was about to be executed, presumably fearful of what awaited him in the next life, he came clean that he had murdered um, the Lady Dowager Mary Babington of, of, of the late uh, Baron of Dunsany's wife. And so the nurse, uh, Nick Cafferty, had been, had been executed, even though it turns out she wasn't guilty of the crime. And you see somebody like the Duke of Ormond, Lord Lieutenant, for large periods in the 17th century. He himself is, is noted as being anti-execution. He does use it sometimes when he deems it to be quite necessary, but he tends to be anti-execution for this very purpose that if you get it wrong, you can't bring the dead back to life. And I think this is one of the areas where uh, capital punishment, I think people are a little bit nervous about it. This idea that in the Middle Ages and the early modern period, everybody gets killed at the end of the trial is, doesn't happen. That's, that's absolutely not the case as far as I can see. It's very, very interesting. We also could look at a little bit um, at things like gender will pop up every now and again. And something that's very strong in criminology at the moment, and I, f I find it fascinating, is approaches both by female criminals, female victims, male criminals, male victims, how we might build our criminal justice system about, around probably more so the behavior of men traditionally, because they're more likely to kill and more likely to be killed. There are some areas where we do specifically kind of target women in our approach to criminal justice. Things like, say, shoplifting, for example, both in the early modern period, where women are more likely to be stealing candlesticks, jewellery, material. Men tend to steal farm animals, you know. And perhaps it's maybe a little bit like that still today. And how do we react when a woman breaks the sort of the, 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 the preconceived ideas of how women should behave in the early modern period, as in the same sense how we treat women who break those 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 civilized boundaries of good behavior in the 21st century. Our reactions sometimes are quite different. Uh, so just some interesting entries. The top one there, that's 1652, that's Cromwellian Galway. Uh, and when you need the Cromwellians to to sort of lessen the full impact of your criminal justice system, maybe it's saying something about how harsh it might be, or indeed how perhaps maybe we were a little unfair to the poor Cromwellians, ordered by the commissioners that two women condemned to be burnt for murdering two children be hanged instead, according to English law. Uh, again, I think lessening the sentence, they're going to die anyway. The, the, the script there um, is from Clonmel, 1663. Jane, the late wife of Garrett Comerford, convicted at the Assize, 6th of October, uh, 25th year of the reign of Charles II for murdering her said husband and judgment thereupon given against her to be drawn and burnt. So again, a murder is a, is a treason. So she gets burnt. She can't be hanged, drawn and quartered because it's, you know, it, it, uh, it, it uh, could have a woman nude on the, on the scaffold being cut up. So the men are hanged, drawn and quartered. Women are burnt alive or usually alive, drawn and burnt. And having then demanded the benefit of her belly, saying that she's pregnant, uh, and thereupon found a jury of matrons to be big with quick child, so in the second trimester, hath been reprieved and continued in jail ever since. I don't know what happens to her there afterwards, but again, I think that reluctance to, to, to see a woman burnt, uh, we know she committed a crime, the exact circumstances of it, obviously, we don't know. And then your standard one in Finglas in 1590, two women out fighting on the street, 
uh, not behaving in a sort of a typically what we expect to be a ladylike fashion. Do you know, he's the sense of the 16th century term, ladylike, and also the 21st century uh, uh, one as well. And you'll often see, for instance, gendered crimes like something like uh, women who gossip too much or who say cruel words out in the public to other people, something that men are not prosecuted for in the early modern period, whether they're not committing the offence or whether it's just a gender specific crime in the same way that we still have gender specific crimes today, particularly around things like, say, something like rape, uh, where it's not an offence to be committed by, say, a woman onto a man. It's, it's you know, it's a gendered crime. Most, uh, most, most recent books on sexual offending in Ireland have, have suggested that is the case. So, too, there's gendered crimes in the early modern period, some of which are male specific and some of which tend to be female specific as well. So something like a ducking stool down by the river, you see them in Carrickfergus in Dublin, just every other town, which is kind of like a large sort of a seesaw with a seat on one end. And it's usually a woman, although it can be a man on occasion, but mostly it's women are put sitting on the seat and then dropped into the stream soaking wet. It's mostly a shame punishment. Obviously, it's uncomfortable to be dumped into the river and these rivers are filthy in all likelihood. But it, it tends to be a, a sort of a, a gender specific punishment in that regard, you know, and it's I think it's 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 it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, so just pushing on, I, I think, do you know what, I'm 10 past nine, I was going to do a sort of a long description of, of what, uh, how the system is built around, but I, I, I simply don't have time, might need to be for something else. Um, the unpopularity uh, of, of the criminal justice system, interestingly enough, uh, bound over by Oliver Fitzgerald, uh, indicted for that he on the 20th of October at Caltra uh, spoke these seditious words following that he did not care a fart for any justice of the peace in the kingdom and that you rogues begin to insult over us, but uh, answer you have a papist king and papist judges. Uh, that's an interesting idea of, of how the community, this is in this case a Protestant, uh, being insulting to the local Catholic JPs at the time of James II and how people perceive that they might own the criminal justice system as opposed to others. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the Houses of Corrections and the criminalization of poverty as well, which is a fascinating area, uh, but I don't think I have time. And then that's, that's a map of Dublin just there. That's right in front of Christchurch Cathedral. Um, Skinner's Row is that, that place from just outside, you know, Jury's, the Jury's Inn up at Christchurch, the Market Cross being the big crossroads. The pillory on the right hand side where you stick your, your head and your hands through sits outside uh, kind of the Lord Edward Fitzgerald pub, that's corner. Uh, and then down on the highway to Merion, you see the gallows, that's down outside. Uh, there's a, a um, there's a convent on Bagot Street just before you cross the canal. Um, and that's where some of the hangings took place, more often than not, across on Gallows Green on the north side of Dublin, where uh, kind of near the, the Collins Barracks around that area, back in Blackhall Place. And sometimes other areas as well, Hogan Green, which is kind of in behind between Tower Street and Delir Street, kind of an area uh, around there. You need an open space for your punishments because they're part of a, a community event that the community takes a, an interest in seeing sort of justice being done. And sometimes it's to the detriment of the state when it goes wrong, because sometimes it might be a hero figure to somebody, and other times it's one of deep humiliation, like Atherton when he's when he is eventually executed. And then finally, the placing of heads upon spikes, which is something not specific to Ireland in particular, but that long lasting effect of keeping somebody there in infamy. Not only is it a problem for the afterlife, because when we're all resurrected in the last days, or hopefully we all will be, uh, we need our heads near our bodies. Um, so when the heads come off, it's problematic, but also it's a, it's a statement about the infamy. So you usually use the spice cumin to preserve the head once it stays up on the spike. When Oliver Cromwell's head is taken off, it stays up on Westminster Hall for, I think, something like 20 years, you know. So I think I will leave it on that. I'm sorry I went on far too long in terms of, of what I thought I could cover as usual. Uh, uh, that happened. If there's anybody still around, like I said, I'm sorry. I, I, my timekeeping as usual is quite poor. That was, um, no, you didn't talk away no problem at all for him there's no panic uh, yeah, I'm sure everyone enjoyed that talk as I, as I did truly fascinating and great work great research you have to do now and that's it's 
sit there for, for another hour. It was um now I have come across some questions here and what we're going to do then is we're gonna unmute people, anyone who wants to talk to you or anyone who wants to ask you a question face to face. Just some of the comments we're after receiving here and questions. And uh, we have Anya F, excellent talk. We have Thomas Bunkert, Bravo Coleman. We have, um, one second, there's quite a few here now. We have um, Grania Blair. When you raised the question about why Ireland didn't have some witch hunting as in other countries, remembering my folklore, etc., I, I strongly feel that it's because we still have a strong affinity with respect to the old traditions of the wee folk. So we didn't blame women to sour milk, strange births, etc., as we presumed it was it was the little folk. Um, do you want to? It, that, it, that's possibly the case. Um, that that this this is essentially the idea that. There's a, a kind of a folklore belief in things like the, the wee people, the fairies and whatever else. And that um, in now, I mean, the problem is there's, there's, there's traditions of, of little people in, in, in Germany and other places as well, which and they do have massive witch crimes. She might well be right. And it, that is certainly a theory and it's quite possibly the case. It's, it's not really an area I'm, I'm strong enough to be able to say definitively whether I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement with, with, with Gronje there or not, but it, it's perfectly plausible that that's part of it at least. Other people have said it's because we've got such a, a big um, sort of sectarian divide that Catholics and Protestants are more worried about each other than they are about, about bullying their, their elderly women who are, who are you know, because witches tend to be old, isolated, single or widowed women and becoming a, a, a sort of a drain on their society. And so they're perfectly the perfect person to blame for everything and to get rid of. And that's kind of why it's it's sort of gender and age issue as well. But then sometimes the the younger people as well, the Alan McGee people, if I remember correctly, are younger in Salem, which trials are the same. It, it's very hard to explain. I don't like I don't have an answer. Um I, I'm not sure. I, somebody like uh like Andrew Snedden, I'm sure will have a much better explanation. You have a... Oh, Cormac McDonald, that, were, that was another uh, great talk tonight. Well done. We have um, Aidan O'Connor, building cabins without brick or stone, a crime. Um, that was in Kilkenny. We have Neve McGann, great talk. Thank you to all involved. And um, Anya F, the witchcraft trials in early modern Ireland were mostly focused in the north of Ireland among Presbyterian communities. Uh, Liam O'Rourke, thank you very much, Coleman. Fascinating talk and a very neglected area of history. A somewhat broad question, but is there any evidence that the reformation of manners that emerged in late 17th century Britain and Ireland may have played a role in the ideas of maintaining social, moral and political authority in early modern Ireland? Um, I, I think it does to a, to a point at least. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like like Liam was saying, it it sort of it, it tends to be something that we associate with the, the the end of the of the of the 17th century and into the 18th, and certainly yeah of course I mean people are are constantly trying to usually the sort of upper classes are trying to talk down to those further down the social ladder trying to improve and to to improve their behaviours I I think that's probably part and parcel of it yeah and things like church courts as well you know there's always a, a sort of one of the big issues with Ireland I think is is Perhaps now I might be wrong about this. I probably need to think about it a bit more deeply. But maybe a lack of a lack of homogeneity, uh, homogeneity uh, in Ireland in terms of Irish society um, may make that process a little bit more difficult. You know, because some people may well see themselves as being very different from their neighbours, not just on religion, but also language and culture and other things like that. You know, uh, so perhaps it's it's. It's difficult to say for sure, but I, I'm sure Liam's right in suggesting that it's at least part of the issue, I think. Okay. Uh, Brian Gilligan, very enjoyable and certainly could listen several more hours. Uh, Lisa O'Donoghue, excellent talk, very informative, thank you. Uh, Dermot Bretnick, which community did the victims of which trials come from? Um, uh, uh, women of wisdom, female healers in Ireland. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
just off the top of my head, the Island McGee ones, which which are Island McGee, I think, is about maybe ten or fifteen miles outside of Carrick Fergus. They're, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they're Scottish Presbyterian community. Uh, Florence Newton in Cork, I would think, is to the best of my knowledge a New English Protestant. I might be wrong. Alice Kitelier would be of the Anglo-Norman community in Kilkenny. Um, the 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 two witches killed in Kilkenny that I know of, I don't have a name, I don't even know their gender, probably women, but in theory they might not be. If they're living in Kilkenny, chances are they're 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 part of the Anglo-Norman community or at least anglicised uh, Irish people. But again, I, I can't be absolutely sure about that. So most of them will be sort of of the of the sort of general sort of under the, the banner of British, I suppose. We have Ian. McKillick here. In Scotland, the witchcraft trials took place in the non Gaelic areas. Uh, Bridgeshock and Banner Bridgeshock, Wizard and Witch, are borrowings from English into Gaelic. Yeah. We have uh, Miriam Anderson, really interesting talk, very enjoyable and informative. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we have Rebel Radio. How did the change in or implementation of license, licensing laws to regulate alcohol sales change the justice system? Um. Um, it, it, it's funny, actually, because we, we, we get the initial licenses for, for selling beer and aquavite or, or whiskey uh, in, in, I think it's in the 1630s and possibly there's others before that point. And there are regulations along. And again, the, the sort of, these sort of laws and issues seem to be quite modern when I, when I, when I say them out loud, things like uh, people are concerned that there's too many bars around the place and that there's too much alcohol being sold and we need to restrict us, not to the point that we're restricting sort of hours, but there are people saying you can't be opening bars on a Sunday. You know, it's kind of the sort of same as the holy hour to, to a point that certain days need to be kept for sort of family and good behavior and that we're consuming too much alcohol. And also uh, a lot of people, I think, correctly assuming that regulation of beer and alcohol sales uh, is not just about improving society and the behavior of people but also about uh, about generating revenue for the state you know okay and um we're just we're just getting the it's just everybody's just coming with thanks to poor lectures it's, it's, it's very very positive comments here now and um i'm sure liam will, will send them on to you when he gets when he gets, when he gets uh, well, that. She'll send on all the comments. Yeah, so. Um, right, so Liam, is it possible if we can unmute and maybe allow anybody who wants to talk to Corman face to face? Yeah, I've just done that there now. So. Hopefully that's possible. So if you want to take it, you're brave enough to take it. Yeah, question, absolutely. Far away. Uh, I've got a mop chasing yeah, me around yeah. my study here. So if you see me moving quite erratically, it's because I'm being attacked. But sorry, I'm, I'm all ready to go. If anybody has any questions, I'll be delighted. Or comments or anything. Oh, it's, 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 it's one of these sort oh, of yeah. historian phrases that it's for... an ongoing project. So I'll, I'll sort of sort of accept any criticism. Oh my God. Yeah, so I'm going to go for it. Uh, I'm unmuting everybody here, and okay, it could it could be bedlam, but uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, uh, they can jump in. Okay, is there Colin? Can you hear me? I can hear you good. Yeah. Okay, I'm on. You know, with the brain injury, I'm bedazzled by the Zoom. Very interesting, and what I'd like to ask those organising is, when are we going to get part two? You know the bit that you left out at the end? Uh, well, I mean, I could do it any time if, if, yes. if else is prepared to put them forward. I'd say, I'd say there's like at least three talks finished. Yeah, but I was, perhaps it was a bit ambitious of me trying to, to cover too much, you know. But yeah, like, we always do that. I think this earlier, I think, to Colm or to Liam, that's that I usually yeah. kind of go into a lecture hall with about 10 minutes worth in my head, but when you actually, once you start talking, you know, you I'm sure going. I know. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I'm sorry about that. It didn't seem very organized, I'm sure. Yes. 
But uh, no, I'd love for no, a excuse. Nothing to apologize for. It was great. And even in the chat, we, of course, then we all ended up. By the way, I've sent you um, um, a cartoon. It's on your own page. Oh, Good brilliant. night, everybody. I'm off to watch Mrs. America. Goodbye. Okay. Okay. Let's take care, Connie. Um, I was, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you're going to look at corruption in application of the law. Uh, and I was thinking in particular the case of uh, Major Sir, who apparently was, um, he'd be more into Colmo Rourke's area, I think, 1798. <clears throat> A major hunter of uh, Republicans. Um, and, um, well, I suppose you could call him the equivalent of a, a chief superintendent in the time, but, but, but more hands-on. And speaking of hands-on, definitely hands-on to people's valuables and uh, then selling them on and so on. So that would be uh, one case of um, a famous one, but there, there's probably quite a few others where people have, um, and I'm not talking about, um, you know, the state. Uh, sorting out a, a trial to make sure to get the result they want, which uh, Daniel O'Connell often spoke about as well, about packing what? juries and all that yeah. stuff. I'm talking same, about more... Just saying that. Word, uh, yeah, exactly. Pretty fat one, though. Yeah, no, look. Yeah, exactly. Look at, the, look at the hairy yeah. patch. Yeah. Do you see the hairy yeah. patch? Yeah. She's going to be that size before we leave this group. Uh, yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm not sure what I can I like it, in terms of kind of policing she figures.